We are here with the one, the only, Trent Haga. At the end of the day, how do you think of yourself? Is it writer? I guess I like to think of myself as a filmmaker. It covers writing, it covers producing, it covers acting. We're actually in your writing room. This is, as they used to say on MTV Cribs, is where the magic happens, right? This is my office. It's a little small building separate from my house. For a young aspiring filmmaker, slash writer, slash director, any of the above, would you have any specific advice to them? There are certain things you can try to do to get to where you need to go, but there are also like unquantifiable things like luck, meeting the right people at the right time, meeting the guy who happens to have a fat wallet at the moment. There's a million different things that can either skyrocket your career at a moment's notice or scuttle it. I am from the Midwest. I'm a little bit more blue collar in the way I approach everything, so instead of just coming right out of the gate and being like, I'm a director and all I want to do is write and direct, and then writing screenplays and, and refusing to sell them unless people let me direct them or, or something like that. I mean, I've always looked at it like, what can I do today? What, uh, what can put some money in my pocket right now? Uh, which is, you know, I started out as an actor in a movie called Terror Firmer uh, uh, and then worked my way behind the camera and ended up writing that company's next movie. But the next job I had was probably working as a production assistant on something. A lot of people I think look at it like it's a sniper rifle. And my goal is I want to be a director and so I'm only going to aim one specific bullet at that directing job. And I'm going to keep shooting and shooting and shooting and shooting and shooting until hopefully I hit it. I tend to look at my plan as more of a shotgun. You know, I just blast out in all directions because you might take a PA job just filling a cooler full of sodas and you could meet the person that eventually, it might not happen immediately, but two years down the line might be a producer on your movie. Technology aside, how else have things changed in terms of the advice that was given in that book? And I think that the advice that the book had is more fitting for our time now than it was then precisely because of technology. I mean, a lot of uh, filmmaking was a very expensive process. Buying film, having a person who was an expert at loading the camera, making sure you get destroyed, uh, uh, processing that film, transferring the film via telecine, all these steps got eliminated. Make your own damn movie just encourages you to figure out a way to do it even if you maybe don't have all the tools that were at your disposal. Working within your budget helps, but if you're creative and dedicated enough and you have enough drive and you work hard enough, you can work way outside of your budget if you use your imagination. I think that's always been the case, but I think it's even more so the case because of the ease and availability of, of recording equipment. I mean, you can take the phone that is in everybody's pocket now and make a movie. Now whether the movie will be any good or not is entirely up to you, but you have the tools at your disposal and they're inexpensive and, you know, abundant. There was a movie entitled Bad Match. It's on Netflix, or it was, probably yeah. still is. Your own parents watched it <laughs> and they didn't recognize you. They didn't even know you were in it. It's the best review I ever got in my entire life for my acting, quite frankly, was, uh, yeah. My parents watched a movie that, uh, that, that my, my son, Max, had done some voiceover work for it. And so, and my friend David had directed it, and so, and it came on Netflix, and I said, hey, David's movie with Max's voice is on Netflix, you should check it out. And my mom and dad watched it, and then they called me a couple of week later, and they were like, oh my God, we watched David's movie, and we heard Max, that's so great. And I said, well, what did you think of my role, mom? And she was like, what, you were in that movie? let a woman manipulate you into murder and kidnapping, you gotta learn how to stand up for yourself. Can I at least get up? My knees hurt. You ready to party, Chip? <laughs> you about to have one of the best nights of your life, boy. Get your head in the game. Where is my money? <laughs> <laughs> no! This is not exactly what I'd call a healthy relationship, Chip. Yeah, no kidding. I made a lot of movies in various capacities. 
Um, and a lot of them are just fucking garbage. But I've made a handful of movies that I really stand behind. Even though something like 68 Kill sometimes seems like a light, fluffy, you know what I mean, just a thing. It's a thing that people are going to consume and forget about. I think there's enough weirdness, there's enough pathos, there's enough something inside of me trying to get out that I think it's going to have some kind of legs in the same way that Cheap Thrills and Dead Girl Diddy. Those movies were movies that were screenplays that I would written that got interpreted by other people. And 68 Kill, I think if they would taken the same script and someone else had interpreted it, it would probably appear to be a darker movie. The movies that make me the proudest are the ones that some people really, really, really love, but an equal amount of people like really, really vehemently hate. Are new people watching 68 Kill because it's on Netflix? Yeah, undoubtedly, uh, without Netflix, 68 Kill would have sort of had its little poof and whimpered and died out. We won the Audience Award at South by Southwest. We played a lot of really great festivals. We got good reviews, um, but then when you do a small theatrical run or it comes out on Blu-ray or people have to like actually click three times to pay four dollars to see your thing, you can see the interest wane. You know, this is part of the new streaming thing. People don't, uh, only the hardcore fans, if you want to try to expand to an audience that you might not have had before, uh, it has to be available on a streamer where people, in essence, feel like they're getting it for free. Without Netflix and without the participation of my lead actor, Matthew Gray Goobler, wouldn't have been seen by a fraction of as many people, not even close, you know. Well, it is perhaps a great artistic compliment to you that Marilyn Manson may not know you by name, but he likes Dead Girl, a thing that you wrote, right? Right, right. And I mean, that's the way I have to look at it, and it goes back to my social media thing. I am not the product. You know, you can think of me however you want to because I'm not the product. The products that I've made throughout the years are the product. And of course, would I love it if Marilyn Manson called me up and was like, oh man, Trent Haga, I know you. I want you to direct a music video for me because I loved your movie. But the fact that I know he loves Dead Girl is like pretty cool. Let's see that tattoo. Maybe you can hold up the tattoo of Der Todes King, right? Your book, right? How old were you when you watched, uh, was Der Todes King the first? Uh, I guess Necromantic would have been my first. So how old were you when you watched those films and what did they mean to you? And did they inform your uh, style in any way or your sensibilities? Yeah, no, completely. I think that they came at just the right time. I mean, I was 19 years old. I had just started going to film school. I was very much about trying to discover other ways to tell stories besides Spielberg, which is what everybody at my film school sort of like aspired to be. And I had always been the guy who was like looking into the dark corners and also knew that I had to look at people who were going to make movies with the same sort of resources that I would have. I never expected to get a Spielberg budget, and I haven't. And if I had only expected to get a Spielberg budget, I might never have made a movie by now. But right. Herzog. And these guys are all sort of outsiders. You know How about the Bavas and the Fulci's and stuff like that? I enjoy all those, uh, uh, but for different reasons. Fundamentally, I mean, Fulci was an interesting guy and he made a lot of movies and that's super admirable. And I think that you can't help but to have some of your vision slip through. But he was also just a jobber. You know what I mean? There's something about um, De La Iglesia or uh, Herzog or whatever. There's, they're, they're drawing every single time. They're drawing from a very, very deep personal well. Uh, I mean, I just think his work is really uh, provocative and punky and in your face. And, uh, you know, a lot of people I think are like, oh, he's regressive. We don't need an artist like that in today's sort of political or sociological climate. I would argue that uh, you totally need that. That's what makes him stand out and be so unique is because he's making shit that nobody's got either the gumption or the guts or the balls or the estrogen or whatever the fuck it is to make. The best art to me is the one where it's a little bit dangerous, you know? Whenever I'm writing something, I'm like, oof, should I be doing that? Like, that's when I know I've I hit the sweet spot. You had a Hacker's laser disc. You were what was known in the community as an early adopter of the movie Hackers. I did. I had the laser disc of Hackers. I mean, it was the only way to get it in a widescreen format. And I was in my 20s. I was a full-grown adult man. I know that I wasn't even sort of the target audience for that movie. They were trying to get like the... It's much like a roller boogie was in the 1970s. They were like, Hackers are cool, kids. But there was just something about that movie that I always really liked. Prepare yourself for this one. Okay. Have you seen Dunstan Checks In? Is that a monkey movie? <laughs> yes. Nah. <laughs> What's the one with uh, Danny DeVito and Tony Danza? 
and they got the they got the chimpanzee. Okay. Stuber, Jexy, like a boss. Are these movies interchangeable <laughs> to you? And let's just uh, full disclosure here: you've seen them all at the two dollar second run cinema, the best second run cinema in Los Angeles, according to LA Weekly. Yes. Um, are those movies uh, interchangeable? Is one better than the other? Oh what are your God. thoughts all on right, those so kinds of movies? We're talking about Stuber. Jexy and Like a Boss. That's right. Three movies that I've only paid to see at the $2 movie theater simply so I could get out of the house for a few hours. Otherwise, I would have never. I, I don't even know if I would have watched those movies like on Netflix. Honestly, man, I can't remember much about any of those movies, but I can definitely say that I think that Like a Boss was my least favorite. Anything to say about cheap thrills? All my best scripts seem to come from places of pain and discomfort in my life. I just had a kid. Things weren't really working out for me, like professionally. There was a lot of pressure, and I went to the New Beverly and I saw this movie, House at the Edge of the Park, which I had seen a bunch of other times, but never in the theater. And there was something about that movie coupled with where I was in life. And at the time, I had a man, an agency, Paradigm, which was a pretty big agency, and they read it and were like, why did you do this? Like, you're supposed to be writing me movies that are gonna cost $50 million to make. And years later, I gave it as a writing sample and uh, ended up getting made and becoming quite the critical darling, quite a big hit. So it went from being a movie that an agent told me no one would ever even read or buy or make to six years later getting made, launching a director's career and becoming a huge financial and critical hit. There's a perfect example of the right people at the right time and the right confluence and the right turn of events made that movie which by you know my people my agent at the time was considered just nothing it was worth nothing not even the paper was on and then through the right series of events it got turned into a movie that meant a lot to a lot of people unless there's some immortality we that we're not aware of the day will come when uh, Lloyd Kaufman passes away. Do you feel as though there is someone poised to replace him? Is he irreplaceable? Is there someone, and I don't specifically mean at trauma or relative or adjacent to trauma, is there someone who's gonna pick up the torch for that kind of filmmaking? First of all, it's a unique product from Lloyd Kaufman's mind, you know what I mean? That's what made it so interesting and unique, but also, the reason that Lloyd was able to do what he was able to do is because of timing it had to do with markets, it had to do with emerging technology. He was at the right place at the right time to take his little seed of genius is and grow it. Is that ever matter? Being what? at the right place at the right time, is that ever important? That's 100% important. All right. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Being at the right place at the right time is super important. Lloyd would have always been a genius who was going to make these movies, but he probably made a lot less movies, done it with a lot less comfort, done it with a lot less resources than he, the limited resources he already had. But because of the, the advent of VHS and home viewing, you know what I mean? It allowed guys like him to really flourish. Right now there might be somebody out there that is doing what Lloyd is doing or is going to, but I don't know if they're going to have sort of the, the breadth of you know, public awareness that Lloyd did. We've heard this a few times and it's something everybody says, it's being in the right place at the right time. Yeah, I think, there, I think that there are completely things that you can do to put yourself in the right place at the right time. Now, granted, if you are also very talented, this could be great for you, but I find that most people either have the time and energy to build their skills to become talented. That was always my thing, is if I work hard enough, I can become good enough at what I do, that the work itself will attract the people and I don't have to go on social media. I don't have to like call you up. I don't have to do all this stuff in order to get at the right place at the right time. The work will speak for itself. You can put yourself in the right place in the right time, but if you don't have the skills, it doesn't matter, your movie's gonna be shit. You can be talented and work really hard to make good stuff and not be at the right place at the right time, but your movie's still gonna be okay when it gets made. It'll be a longer road, it'll be a harder road, but at the, at the end of the day, all that matters, I'm gonna die, but my stuff might live if it's good enough. There's only one guarantee your movie's gonna be good, and that's like hard work and, and consistent work, and hard, consistent work over and over and over again. You like Jason Starr, Brian Smith, Lawrence Block, these are authors, any other big literary giants that have like 
majorly influenced you? Richard Lehman is an author that I really uh, uh, took a liking to, read all of his stuff. Edward Lee, Jack Ketchum, Frederick Brown, Jim Thompson, Charles Williford. I could talk about books all day long. I love reading books. I have great admiration for uh, novelists and authors and uh, to me there's something about reading a book that takes me to a place that watching a movie will never do but playing a game, video game will never do and uh, I love it it's my comfort zone do you feel as though Pulp Fiction is more important or more valid than a Trolls World Tour yeah of course I do Okay. <laughs> All right, let's talk about, uh, I've never heard you talk about Trauma's Edge TV, and let me just, full disclosure, I've never seen, I saw one thing about a crackhead one time, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. and that was just a YouTube clip, it was at a point when I was just not going to be sitting there watching Trauma YouTube videos. Yeah. We made the television show for Channel 4 in Great Britain. I was the host, or the co-host, like Tiffany Shepas was doing some stuff out here on the West Coast, I was on the East Coast, and then I moved out here halfway through shooting, so I did half of mine here and half there. And like I met this guy, Florian, who is from the UK, and he got commissioned by the Channel 4 to do a documentary about Trauma's experience at Cannes in 1999. And based on the success of that, he was able to pitch Channel 4 on a television series. I was shooting like several episodes a day and getting paid like 50 bucks. We would go out and shoot like an eight hour day and I would do like two episodes and they pay me 50 bucks. I think I got paid like 250 bucks. Uh, making those things is kind of a blur. There wasn't a lot of prep. There was no rehearsal. Nineteen right? Being John Malkovich, Three Kings, Fight Club. Like that year, man. The, like I just kept going to the movies and being blown away. Uh, Magnolia. Like there was so many great movies that came out that year from what I consider to be visionary people, like up and coming. I was like, the face of American cinema is finally changing. We're getting some weird, unusual voices. When you watch a movie by Kevin Smith or Tarantino or Rodriguez, what was interesting to me is I was watching movies made by a guy who grew up with a single mom, a dude who grew up in Texas with like eight brothers and sisters, a guy who worked at a convenience store in New Jersey, you know what I mean, or whatever, and like, just seeing something that was like, uh, felt like it came from a different sort of a place, you know, was like interesting. And they weren't trying to ape other movies that already existed. You wrote and directed a very short film, part of Death December, called Operation Dolph. Yeah. Uh, any, any idea where it is? What's happening? Is it gonna, are we gonna see it somewhere? Because we got Christmas not that far away. Right, right, right. No, that's a good question, man. I haven't heard from those guys in months. I have no idea. And you know what, it's funny, I hadn't even thought about that project. I totally forgot that we did that and you did the music for it and I think it was a fun, engaging little short. I don't even do shorts really. I'm not interested in shorts as a for, as from a filmmaking point of view because I'm like, what do you do with them? And I think it turned out pretty cool, but uh, you know, who knows if anybody will ever see it. You last saw and chatted with Eli Roth, when <laughs> and where? One time I was at the Egyptian to go see Goblin in concert and the reason I was there is because my friend York Bootgerite was in town because they were showing some of his movies and he called me up and he was like, Trent, let's hang out. And so I took him out for the day and he was like, oh, I got these tickets to go see Goblin, why don't you come with me? And so I went to the Egyptian to go see Goblin with York and Eli Roth comes running up and is like, oh my God, York Bootgerite, he used to come and hang out at the offices at Trauma when we were editing Terra Firmer. He's like a background extra in that movie and I do believe he's also a background extra in Citizen Toxie. You last saw and chatted with James Gunn when and where? When I first moved out here, Lloyd got the contract to write Make Your Own Damn Movie and James had written his other book and I think that James had written Dawn of the Dead and they were like, they had just finished shooting Scooby-Doo. And so Adam Janke, the other writer of Make Your Own Damn Movie, and I called up James. And we were like, can we take you out to lunch? We just want to pick your brain about what it's like to write a book for Lloyd. You last saw and chatted with Joe Lynch when and where? Joe Lynch was a groomsman at my wedding in 1999. We both made our first movie, Terra Firma, together. I mean, he's now gone off to do his thing. And uh, I guess the last time I saw Joe was uh, probably at South by Southwest a couple years ago because his movie... Um, Not a screening of Creep Show? The new Creep Show? Oh, 
Jeez, you know better than I do. <laughs> well, I had run into Joe because both of our movies were doing the South by South, or the festival cycle. And then I guess the last time I saw Joe, you're right, Peter, was at a screening of the uh, Creep Show television show. Also at the Egyptian. You bump into everybody at the Egyptian here. You last saw and chatted with Matthew Lillard when and where? <laughs> and for what purpose? Matthew Lillard, actually, uh, I wrote an original screenplay that I was very excited about that got a little bit of attention that uh, almost I got to direct. It got so far as it was going out and actors were reading it and then they were coming to talk to me about it. And Matt Lillard read the script and really liked it and he actually got in his car and came to see me at this you know place that I was sort of working out of and uh, super cool dude. It was the first and only time I ever met him. I would have loved to have hired him to be in the movie but the movie never happened. You last saw and chatted with Courtney Cox when and where? I wrote a movie for Lifetime Network called Tall Hot Blondes is what it was called and Courtney Cox directed the movie she was super fucking awesome to work with. She really knew what she was doing. She protected my script. She protected the artistic vision. She was big enough to be able to stand up to Lifetime when they had bad suggestions. It was great. I put a stack of trading cards next to Trent. Okay. And uh, one at a time, I'm gonna have you pick them up and say something about the uh, property or the concept or the author or filmmaker that they represent. And perhaps you have a story. Okay, here we go. We've got uh, the Blair Witch Project. And it's the first. It spawned a movement. It, uh, did things the Cannibal Holocaust was unable to do, like as far as like capturing the public's imagination. Again, very much a right time, right place sort of a thing. And the filmmakers were fans of Troma and gave us a VHS copy of that uh, when they were trying to sell it at Cannes in 1999 or whatever. And we had seen all these flyers they'd been pasting up everywhere that were missing flyers that looked very realistic or whatever. We didn't understand that they were part of a guerrilla marketing. And of course, Trauma was always there at Cannes running around with signs and doing all kinds of shit. And we were having the premiere of Terra Firma. And these two guys, Edward and Daniel, were just had their backpack full of their shit. They, were, had never, they hadn't even sold this movie yet. And they came by and they were like, oh my God, Trauma, we love you guys. And they gave us a copy of it. And I took it home and watched it at my apartment in New York on my VHS, uh, which, you know, I never saw it in the theater. I think that the way I saw it was like the way it was intended to be seen. You know what I mean? On a TV in your house. What do we got here? Take a look at it. Charles Bukowski. That's pretty cool. I mean, what a guy. What an interesting dude. What a man from another era. Drunken writer. Great writer. Much like how I was talking about how Tarantino or, or Rodriguez, you just see movies that come from a Another, the other side of tracks from a different point of view, from whatever, you know what I mean? Bukowski was that for literature. All right, what do we got here? A rather iconic scene. T2 stabbed. Okay, this is Terminator 2, and it's the guy drinking a milk, and then the uh, Terminator 1000 turns into a thing, and Terminator Part 1 was the first R-rated movie that I ever, my parents allowed me to see in the theater. It was my 13th birthday. It was in December of uh, whatever year that was, 83, 84, something like that. Uh, so Terminator was super important to me. By the time Terminator 2 came out, I think I was a junior or a senior in high school. I was uh, working at a video store. I was a total movie head. And it didn't have the raw, sort of skeevy vibe that I loved about Terminator. You know what I mean? Terminator, the guy's like walking around like blasting a discotheque to try to kill a woman. Like, it's pretty like, whoa, what the fuck? Part two was almost like a uh, higher budgeted, higher concept, but weaker sauce version of that. And even though the tech was whatever, and certainly it just didn't move me in the same way that Terminator did it. Did you see uh, Titanic and Avatar in theaters? I've never seen Titanic. Uh, whoa. You've never seen Titanic. <laughs> what is about what 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 is there to interest me about Titanic? When Titanic came out, I was working for the entertainment journalism site. It was like Titanic fever. They were shoving it down my fucking throat. I was the dude who was like, why aren't Chow Young Fat movies huge? Why the fuck is the Titanic huge? And I just never saw it. I was like, oh, it's a romance with like a 30 minute like super climax. Like, eh. and I don't know. It was more of a pushback on how everybody loved it. 
and how much money it made. When is that headshot from? Where was it? Do you have anything to say about it? Had acted in a bunch of movies and then people started asking me for headshots and I really didn't want to go and get one made because that would have cost me money and whatever. So a good friend of mine named Kyle Emma, who was like sort of an amateur photographer, he also worked for the entertainment website. I went over to his apartment with Lynn, my girlfriend at the time, now my wife, and we were just like, he was messing around. He had his camera. And here's my wife and I from the same, ah. the same set. I've never told this story before. This is a good one, Peter. Wow, okay. uh, so I went and I was the writer of Dead Girl and I went with the directors to the casting agency to go look at some tapes of up and coming actors to play these things. And the directors of Dead Girl said to the casting director, oh, Trent does some acting too. And she was like, oh, you do? Well, like, give me some headshots and I'll see if I can get you some roles or whatever. And I was like, oh, okay, cool. And I reached in my bag and I pulled out that headshot and I handed it to her and she looked at it and she was like, throw this in the garbage. That's not a headshot. You're not an actor. Get out of here. Next card. Oh, yeah. Starship Troopers. One of the few filmmakers that I feel was able to achieve commercial and critical success while still maintaining an insanely unique artistic vision. Paul Verhoeven can never be underestimated in my opinion and although I consider Robocop to be his masterpiece, Starship Troopers is a rock solid and very close second place. Alright, alright. Uh, that strange sensation from the Toxic Crusaders. Toxic Crusaders, I really don't have much to say about, man. I mean, fundamentally, it was way past my, my time. I was an original USA Up All Night real Toxic Avenger guy. By the time the cartoons came out, I was well past the age of cartoons. Watching cartoons as an adult was not fucking cool when I was a teenager. Nowadays, I feel like everything's changed, like geek culture has taken over, and now you can unabashedly watch a cartoon as an older person, but when I was 16 years old, nobody would be caught dead watching a kid's cartoon. Ah, uh, boy. Federico Fellini, La Dolce Vita. I got nothing to say, Peter. I've never actually watched that movie. Oh, yeah. Okay, so here's the Marx Brothers. Animal Crackers, one of their classics. I just tried to show my nine-year-old some Marx Brothers recently. Man, Cracker Jack writing. They just don't do it like this anymore. Second and third viewings of Marx Brothers movies like reveal more and more. They're so densely packed with physical and verbal humor. I love the Marx Brothers. Ooh, it's a Japanese Dracula card. This looks like Christopher Lee's horror of Dracula, if I'm not mistaken. Right, you are. Right, exactly. I love the Hammer movies. I understand that uh, to some the pacing is like fucking glacial, but I also enjoy that. I used to go and work on my grandparents' farm all day long in Indiana, and then the reward would be at the end of the day, I could like drink some Minute Maid juice and watch one of the two or three TV channels they could pick up, and there was always like an afternoon horror show, and uh, I remember seeing Horror of Dracula and that scene at the end where Peter Cushing's got the candlesticks and he makes the cross, and then they pull down the curtain, and Christopher Lee goes through his like burn up, you know what I mean, and just leaves the ring there and whatever, and it was like, wow. Taste the Blood of Dracula, another great one. Uh, I love those movies. But so speaking, like, before we get to the final card, mm -hmm. speaking of uh, the farm, I have to ask my question number one. Have you had an <laughs> apple before? Have you ever eaten an apple? An apple, an apple. Those are those uh, sweet, round, red fruits, generally red, right? Yes, I have eaten an apple. As you said, I do associate it with my grandparents had a farm in southern Indiana in addition to cattle and d duck pond and uh, gardening and whatever. They had about four apple trees down the way and my grandma would send me with a bucket and I would go and you get the apples that had just fallen and were on the ground. Like, you know, they were just ripe enough, and she would have me go pick were up. They, I'm sorry, were they warmed by the sun? <laughs> <laughs> Indeed, because you have not really had an apple. Everybody's experience of apples are crisp apples that are refrigerated and whatever. And the real taste of an apple can only come when you pick it right off the ground after it's fallen off of a tree and it's been sitting in the sun and it's a little bit warm and soft. And you take a bite and they're like super juicy. And I mean, it tastes more like an apple than any apple you will ever get at the grocery store that's been in the fridge. Well, uh, here we go. This is the Trent Haga, the official Trent Haga card. 
featuring on the back the famous uh, uh, headshot. Famous headshot. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. And on the front here it says, this, mind you, this is 2005. Trent Haga has been involved in over 30 feature films as a writer, producer, and actor, including Terror Firmer, Suburban Nightmare, and The Ghouls. For more information, visit www.trenthaga.com. So. Yeah, well, don't visit trenthaga.com because there's... <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing there. And don't buy it either, because I don't know what it is. Any final thoughts, final things you want to say? No. <laughs>